This is Drom Shekasuto. Bezrat Hashem. So I um, um, for you guys who knows me, so um, I'm kind of a, a, a truthful, desire the truth person, and um, you know, not always, not in every situation, you can. Uh, the Torah, the truth, the wisdom is wider than the sea and there are different colors to the water and different uh, different bays, different shores, different countries, different islands it's also the, the water not in the same taste, not the same amount of salt, not the same fish it's all water but it's every time like you want it you want to see the sea? Okay, so here it looks different and there it looks totally different. But it's the sea, it's the water. So also when you want to say Torah, you want to talk about the truth. So there is so much to say and you cannot cover it all at once. It's kind of hard, right? Like for one hour we're going to talk only Torah and we'll, take, we'll show pictures of the sea. You're not going to cover the whole sea. Like even if a whole hour, a whole year, you're going to just see pictures of sea. Like in in crazy speed, you won't cover ten percent of the of the ocean. You won't like it's it's so gigantic, it's so large, and the Torah is wider than the sea. So we must understand that every time we come to learn something, we need to understand that we're learning a certain topic, that we're touching a certain point we're viewing a certain aspect of it even it, even that topic that we learned today and we put all our effort on it we barely scratch the the outside layer of it because there is no end to the depths of this world and like that in physicality it goes like that and I spoke about it in the last um, couple of days you can see infinity in every part of creation. We'll take the example of the sea. So, like we said, if you want to look at it, there is no end to, to the pictures and uh, of the beaches and the waves and the depths of it. And if you go, there are so many species of animals and fish swims. And also, not only today, in the past, and you can go and like, the number of animals that the sea holds and contain and life that it's treasured inside of it and if you go deeper so of course there's no no end to how much you can understand because every animal itself if you're going to start investigating is built from endless amount of cells and 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 it's so deep and if you'll take one cell of one of those mm, cute and amazing animals and try to, to dissect it and put it under the microscope, there is no end to the atoms that built it and, and, and it contains. It's, it's like, it's endless. It's infinity. And the sea is one thing and, the wa and, the, and, and, and every tree and all the trees and all the flowers and all the animals and all the people and all the countries and all the books and all the furnitures and all the walls, all the pictures. Let's speak on, you cannot stop investigating this world, it doesn't end. You look at the stars, you look at this, uh, the sky, you look at the space. There is no end to creation and there is no end to creation. So, and especially when we're talking about spirituality, we're talking about the Torah, we're talking about the wisdom of Hashem. Over there it's even wider, there's no end, really there's no end to it. In the end, in creation, even if you're going to investigate, you're going to come to that place that you can, in the end, measure everything. Maybe a human being, maybe a person not able to, but really, by the fact that the Creator created something and it received a physical form, a certain physical amount built from certain material, you can measure it. In the end, you can count it. There is a precise amount of 
stars. Maybe we don't know how to count so many, but there is an amount when you understand that the Creator created it. To physicality, really, there is an end in the end. But the Torah is wider than the sea. The wisdom of heaven is deeper than that because there is a border between physicality to spirituality. And when you cross that border and you reach heaven, there's no end to, to that path. It, it leads you to, to beyond and on and, and never going to stop. So to you guys that knows me, so I don't need to warn you because like I said, you know me that I'm a truth seeker and I'm not dropping the truth even when it hurts. And to those ones that don't know me yet, so uh, I hope you're not going to get scared tonight. <laughs> because I want to discuss some topics. I wanted to speak about some issues. Like, come on, let's, uh, let's face it. How many years we can, uh, we can deny and we can hide and we can uh, put masks on our faces and, and to play a certain game that, uh, that we don't really believe in, that we don't really want to play? Like, how many years, how many generations are we going to act and, uh, and play? So, I wanted to... <coughs> I wanted to tell you a few things. I wanted to discuss a few topics. I wanted to, to approach a certain issue. I think for me it's very painful that people, and including me, are not going all the way with their truth, their own truth. And sometimes it happens to us because we don't know how to deal with the truth. We don't know what to do with it. And I wanted to bring us tonight to this point. And even if in the end of this class we will stay with more question marks and with more doubts and without clear answers, I think it's good. I really truly think that it's good because I think that the path the way to learn is by asking questions. I think that people that don't ask can never be answered. They can never know the truth. And we need to ask for Hashem. We need to know Hashem. And there are many situations in our lives that we don't know, that we cannot figure out, we cannot understand. Hundreds or maybe thousands of children are being kidnapped from their houses every year, out of their houses, in, pa in, in parks, on their way back from school, disappearing. Something, okay? It happens in the world. Wars. Millions of soldiers until today didn't came back home. Parents who were waiting for their beloved children to come back home didn't. They didn't. Women are being molested, raped, abused. Also men, also boys, also girls. Thousands, millions in different generations. And also today. People are getting sick. People suddenly receive horrible news that they're sick in certain illnesses, that there's no cure as of today. We're talking about bad news that are hitting the world since the beginning of it. Every family experienced one of those things or more. Every person been exposed to those things. Now we're claiming to be believers, right? We, we have faith. We're coming to learn Torah. Okay, so what's the answer? What's your answer? What are we doing with that? We believe that Hashem, the creator of the universe, the creator of the world, He created heaven and earth. He makes sure that everything will work right. He is the divine and ultimate supervisor on our creation. Where is He? What's going on? Like, 
Where was he when my husband cheated on me with my best friend? Where was he when my daughter went, wanted to come back home and some group of boys start like harassing her? Like, where is he? Where was he when my child was a soldier in the Six Days War? When, when, when my father fought in Vietnam? Like, wh wh what? Where? Where is he? Those are questions that we need to ask. So there are answers, okay, but I'm asking you. Are those answers satisfying you? Like, okay, you can live with that answer? Because the Gemara, the ancient scripts, are telling us that there are three kinds of people that you cannot call their lives life. They don't, they're not alive. They don't live. They're not happy. Things are not well, they're suffering. Who are those three kinds? People that have problems of anger, the ones that are angry and upset all the time, you cannot call their lives life. The cheap ones, those that cannot spend money, <laughs> they're suffering. <laughs> like, it's hell, <laughs> you cannot call it life, it's not life. And the kind ones, the merciful ones, those that feel, those that have emotions and feelings to others. You cannot call it life. It's not life. You open your eyes in the morning, you don't want to be awake. You go and cross the day, you don't, you, you, like, you love everyone, you care about everyone, you want to help everyone, and nothing works. Like, everything is stuck. So, you cannot call it life. Like, where's the salvation? Where's the answer? So, the Torah is providing an answer. There is a hastara. Hastara, what does it mean, hastara? We just finished celebrating Purim. Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther, is telling us that the Creator, even though that He's hiding, that He's hidden, that we cannot see Him, the name of the Creator is not even mentioned one time, once in the Megillah. There is no Hashem, God forbid. We cannot see Him. No one is talking about Him. Yeah, we're praying. Yes, we listen to the wise, righteous ones. Yeah, we're following the rules. But no one can see anything. But we believe that Hashem is hiding, that the Creator is hidden. Where is He hiding? Backstage, behind the curtains. I'm asking you now. If you... have been told that you have a father, but you never saw him. He never called you. He never answered your phone calls, your letters. You went to the place that had been called his home. You knocked on his door. No one ever opened, never answered. Until when you're going to keep on going and asking for him? Probably you're going to stop one day. Like, when you'll be 30, 40, let's say 50, like you're going to start living your own life one day, right? Like, but we are believers. We don't give up on Hashem. We believe in Hashem. Now I'm asking you, what does it mean to believe in Hashem? To believe in Hashem that He is there, that He exists, it's not a complete faith. That's not enough. Because He can be there, and if that's the condition of the world with so many judgments and so much pain and the amounts of pain that I mentioned tonight is nothing compared to the pain. It's like it, I, I, I stopped myself very fast from bringing up all the ideas and all the thoughts that I have in my mind. Like I haven't started even. I, I haven't turned on the engine of, of telling you how many judgments like exist in the world. We, we, I won't be able to finish even if I'll run all the way with it. Like, like the sea, like the water, there are judgments with no end. Can't, can't count them. What does it mean to believe in Hashem? What does it mean to believe in the Creator? To believe that He exists, I'll tell you, I think it's not enough. Why it's not enough? Because let's say that that one that runs the creation as it is, as for now, like we know it, like we heard from our parents and our grandparents that had been in the Holocaust and told us about their parents that the 
never saw them again and their siblings that they haven't saw them again and no one know, no one heard if they've been killed or haven't. And you know that six million Jews died in the Holocaust, been murdered, slaughtered, executed in horrible ways. But do you know that 20 million gypsies been killed in the Holocaust as well? Not only six million Jews, also 20 million gypsies been murdered because they were gypsies. Not because that they were violent or rude or horrible. No, they were just different. So they were executed. Now, and more and more and more. It was crazy. Now, if you believe that there is a creator, and you believe that he's running the show, and you have all that darkness that is surrounding you, I think that it's not enough. And I think that's, that is not our faith in Him. Because if the faith, the belief in the Creator was that He exists, we wouldn't continue following Him. Like that parent, like that father that we described. You heard you have a father, all right. And now you go and you knock on His door and you call Him and He doesn't answer. After 20, 30, 50 years, you're going to say, all right, like, sorry. I'm continuing, I'm moving on, like he doesn't love me, that's true, he doesn't care about his daughter, he doesn't care about his child, moving on, I have my own family, I have my own business, I have my own health issues, I like, I'm moving on in my life. You would move on from Hashem also, if you wouldn't know him, that he must be someone so unique and amazing and great, that it's worth it to chase and run after him and to seek for him even after thousands of years that he's hidden, that we cannot see him. So his existence is not a complete faith. To know, to believe in his existence, that's not complete. Okay, we know he's there, but what more than that? Let's say, like many rabbis are saying every day, letova, that everything is for the good, okay? Ask me about it, I will tell you that for me, that verse, that sentence, though that, that way of serving Hashem is one of many. There are times that you should remind yourself that it's all for the good. And there are times that you're not allowed even to mention it, that it's all for the good. If someone is coming to you, and tell you that he had some issues with his child that is not well, that is not healthy, that his child, chas shalom, God forbid, is sick in a horrible illness, something that he doesn't know how to, to heal, and you're going to start telling him it's all for the good, everything is good, it's perfect, it's amazing, it's great, Hashem is good, you need to, like, Whoa, I, if, if I, God forbid, would stand in that situation, I wouldn't continue talking to you. I, I wouldn't have the power to hear your words. If I'm coming to you to share my pain, my sorrow, and you start like telling me that everything is perfect and the world is pink and I must dance and clap for my troubles and I feel the sorrow and the grief and the distance from the Creator, and now you start plastering me with those sentences, with those words, like for me, it would hear like, a, it would sound like a joke, like, like a game. Like, I don't believe that it's good. I cannot see my child suffer. I cannot see my wife in pain. I cannot see my neighbor been kicked out of the house, doesn't have a home. He's homeless now. Like, we don't know how to deal with those things and for sure to, oh, it's all for the good. Yeah, I lost my house. Oh, it's all for the good. Yeah, and I don't have a family. I don't have no one to call to. Yeah, it's all for the good. What do you mean all for the good? Are you telling me, the, me that from your villa? Like, are, like you're talking to me while you have your bank account and no one kicked you from the house and you have your job and, and, and social... Um, uh, support and, and health uh, insurance and like you have parents like how can you tell me that everything is good because you feel good because everything is good with you with me nothing is good when you approach with this method of serving Hashem knowing that it's all for the good I'll tell you sometimes it's right but the sea is so wide 
that not always the water are so clear that you can see that it's all for the good. It's not always for the good. Sometimes there's a shark, sometimes there's a pain, sometimes there's an accident. You need to cry. Sometimes you should feel the pain. Sometimes you also allow to complain. There were many righteous people that fought, that were arguing with Hashem, with the Creator. When, when Hashem, when the Creator said to Moses that He wants to kill all the nation of Israel because of their sin in the golden uh, dancing with the golden calf, Moses didn't say, you know what? It's all for the good. Let them die. It's all. No, you cannot say it's all for the good in that situation. Moses had to fight back. Moses had to tell him, listen, if you want to kill them, you have to kill me first. Moses sent himself to the front line and start arguing and battling and fighting with Hashem and threatened on Hashem and told Hashem, if you want to do that, you're going to have to erase me from the book that you wrote. He was ready to sacrifice himself and to get to such a position that he will be erased for eternity from all good. So Moses, why can't you say it's all for the good? Let's start again. And even Hashem offered that to him. Hashem told him, listen, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be the new beginning. You're going to be the new Am Israel, the new nation of Israel. It will start from you. The blessing that I gave Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will pass to you and you and your children are going to continue. Hashem offered that to Moses and Moses refused. Now who... Will you appreciate more in that argument? For sure Moses. He saved our lives. Okay, so we have an issue with Hashem. How can it be? We have issues with Hashem. We have problems. We have things that have not been solved yet with Hashem. It's very hard to say, yes, Hashem is good without lying. And not because we don't believe that He's good. I'm calling you and inviting you to investigate and to find His goodness, to find that reason, that beginning that starts in the depths of your soul, that is calling you to search for Hashem, because if you use your eyes, if you use your ears, if you use your hands, your senses, you cannot see His beauty, even if the view is fantastic. In this amazing line of, of the sea that looks so gorgeous in the pictures and you want to take your family for a vacation in that cabin, in that house, in, in that private beach and it looks so fantastic. A 15 years old girl been raped by three men three weeks ago and she was screaming and no one heard her. Okay, it's not a perfect beach anymore. The world is not so simple as we want it to be. But we're not allowed to ignore it. And we're not allowed also to back off from our faith because of the challenges and the difficulties. We must go all the way and to make a real and honest investigation to find out who Hashem really is. Why really we're looking for Him? What's really going on here in this creation? Because things look so messed up for us and we cannot figure it out. But we are obligated by the Creator to look for the truth and to ask for the truth and to desire the truth and to seek for it with no end. So what's the truth? Do you have an answer? I'm open for a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Someone have an answer? It's all a test. What? It's all a test. It's all a test. Which test? Are you able to stand in your test? I, not always, no. Okay. And if there are going to be people, you say it's a test. And if I'll ask someone, I'll tell him, you know, brother, it's all a test. And he will ask me, who is testing me? I want to break his hands. <laughs> All right? That's his answer, not yours. You're amazing. Maybe in the hardest hours you're going to reply the same. I'm asking you if that's going to be his answer. So is your answer the answer? 
It's not the answer. It's a test. Okay, you're able to deal with your tests now. Now you are dealing with your tests. Amazing. It's a stage. It's a phase. It's part of your life. You had hours in your life that if you would hear that someone is testing you, you would say, listen, I want to see him face to face. I have something to tell him about those tests because I cannot stand it anymore. I'm not willing to stand it anymore and I'm not planning to stand it anymore. There is a moment and if you're going to make an investigation into yourselves, you're going to find a place inside of yourselves that you are saying, telling Hashem, the creator of the universe, listen, leave me alone. I don't want that anymore. I don't want, if that's your will, I don't want it anymore. Ask yourself, do you have a moment that in that moment you fall to despair? You're able to give up on your life? A moment. If you have that moment, that in that moment you lose your mind and you don't have the power, you go to take a bottle of scotch, you go to smoke weed, you go to run away from your troubles, you take out your life-saving mobile with Facebook. Oh, thank you, Hashem, I don't need to think anymore. Oh, at least other people, they have life. Oh, so amazing. Oh, nice car accidents. Oh, it's so funny. Oh, poor girl. Oh, oh, horrible father. Okay, running away from your life. Why are you running away? Why are you running away? You're running away because you have a certain point in your life that you cannot stand the test anymore. It's too much. Freaking out. No, I'm not standing that. If that's a supervision on my life, so I'm out of it. I'm not going to suffer anymore. Okay, so what's the answer? Who is Hashem? Someone have an answer? I can talk. My wife will testify on that. Who is Hashem? It's written on Hashem that... Tash Kocho, that he lost his power. It's written on Hashem that Hashem, he has all the powers. He is Kol Yachol. He's able to do whatever he wants. Okay, a question. Can Hashem create a stone that will be too heavy for him to lift? Can he do that? That superpower creator that can create everything. Anything he desires. Can he create a stone that will be too heavy for him to lift? No. He cannot. There's no way in the world that he can. So can he do anything he wants or can't he? Who is Hashem? I'm asking you. What? It's more than just belief and it's like a relationship with your actual father that they mess up, they make mistakes, but at the end of the day you know he loves you, you love him and those mistakes just kind of pass because the love is You so say you love him and you say he loves you back. That's amazing. Right. I'm happy to hear about it. <laughs> I can tell you that I have students that are very honest, like you and me, truthful people. And they told me, I never felt love from Hashem. I want it. I desire it with all my heart. I'm trying to follow and to obey. But the truth I'll tell you, none of my prayers ever been answered. I never saw wonders. I never felt a hug. I never felt love of Hashem. And if you're going to tell me that that's the reflection of the love of Hashem, like the great view or happiness of others, I don't know. It doesn't talk to me. I want salvations in my house. I want to feel the warmth. I want to feel the love. There are going to be people that will tell you, I never felt loved by no one. What are you talking about? Okay, should love themselves. How can I? There are going to be a person that will tell you, I messed up my life. You should love yourself, you'll tell him. I hear you. He will tell you, I can't stand myself. What are you talking about? You know, you have people, you have men, that borns to this world and they are let's say 13 years old and they since they bo were born they feel like a woman like a girl they are feminine inside and they're boys and their organs and their body everything is male but inside 
she's a girl, it's a woman, and she cannot stand her being like she is a prisoner in a body and she wants to peel her skin off. She doesn't want to breathe from that body. She cannot. Start loving yourself, you tell her, or you tell him, not accepting his feminine spirit. What are you doing with it? Accepting it. Accepting? She needs to accept it? Mm -hmm. She's not able. She hates her being. She has a foreign she voice. She looked at herself in the mirror, and the one that she sees in the mirror, a woman that found herself in a fire, and all her face, she lost her face in the fire. She has burns and scars all her face. She cannot look at the mirror. You have people that are not able to look at themselves in the mirror. People that cannot smell their own smell. People that have been so abused, been so hurt, that they're not able to function. They're scared to move out from their house. They're not able to go to make shoppings. They cannot talk to people. They cannot laugh. They're afraid what people will think about them. They are terrified. They've been traumatized and abused forever. Who is Hashem? How are you going to explain to that poor girl, to that poor boy, that Hashem is good? Do we have an answer? I, 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 have my, I have my way of dealing with my life. That's what I have. To tell you that it's an answer, for me it answers any, everything. But to tell you that it's the answer, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not bringing the news now. I'm just saying the truth, my truth. I'm being honest. I think there has to be an approach that's tailor-made to somebody who's suffering, that you can't just have one line bring them towards the Hashem. It has to be very personal. It has to be with a lot of empathy and understanding. Mm -hmm. And no, you can't just walk around saying it's all good. It's, that's not going to work. Right. But you have to have the sensitivity to understand and just to listen. To that's just be quiet. To just be quiet and let the person express their pain. But how I'm going to help him, how I'm going to help her to deal with her sorrow? Now, she knows that her husband died and she loved him like we never loved in our lives. Maybe she's supposed to express her anger. Maybe okay. Amazing, amazing, Maybe amazing. That's Maybe that's the, her point. Maybe from that point now she needs to scream. Okay. Nothing wrong with being angry at God. Amazing. It's healthy. Beautiful. It's healthy sometimes to be angry on God because that's how you express your honesty. That's how like... If there is God above and He commanded us to follow Him and He is the God of truth, Hashem Elokechem Emet, and He asked us to follow Him means that we should follow the truth. So if the truth now is that I suffer, I cannot dance. I'm not able to dance when I'm sad. I'm not able. So now to stay sad, if I'm able to climb above it, great. That's my challenge. That's my mission. I should work on it. But if I cannot, it's okay for me also to cry. Gates of tears never been locked. Sometimes it's okay to be sad, to be upset, to be angry. It's amazing. Those are amazing answers. When I'm looking at it from every angle, that I'm looking at it, I can blame myself, even me, that I, I live like, I cannot say that my life is normal, like nothing is normal in my life, but like I'm kind of not doing so much bad, let's say. I'm, I'm kind of trying to do the best I can with my life, like all the time. I'm waking up in the morning to do good, I go to sleep at night to do good, I do good, I try with all my power 24-7, all the time. I'm trying with my children, with my wife, with my students, with families, like all the time with every person I speak, I'm coming in touch with. I'm only trying to be the best that I can. I'm saying it with all my broken heart to pieces, telling you the truth. That's my will. That's who I found this person inside of me. I kind of like him. And I, I chose to, to, to let him express his goodness. And, and that's who I am. Like for many years already, I'm only running and doing good in the world. But I still find myself that 
if I will investigate every hard situation that I will look around me that is painful, that people suffer from, I can blame myself on it. I can blame myself. Even though that I'm not such a horrible person and my friends will testify on it and my family will testify on it, I'm, I'm an okay guy, I'm okay, I'm trying to do good. But in reality, if I will go deep, I will find lackings in every aspect of my life. If I will go all the way with judgment, I can blame myself on everything that happens. I can find those defaults inside of me very easily. Why? Because darkness still exists in the world. When darkness still exists in the world, it reflects on you and you reflect it out to the world. All this world based and built and designed in that way that your thoughts are being reflected, catching vessels, shapes in the world. You can see yourself in situations. Why you recognize that that person is rude? Why you see that that woman, she's cheap? Why you see that that person doesn't have no patience? Because you know yourself that in that situation, you would act the same. You know it about yourself or else you wouldn't recognize it. You recognize it from yourself, from your self-awareness. You know that you can be cruel to your child. You know that you can lie sometimes. You know that you can avoid responsibility. You know that you can fail so you can recognize your weaknesses, your lackings in others. Because they're familiar to you. Because you have them inside of yourself. Maybe you're not all the time like that person. Maybe you're not as radical as that person. But in the end of the day, you can find all the lackings of the world in yourself as well. I think that that's the key for that mystery, for that question, for that, 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 that riddle of, 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 of the world. I think that the Creator and His wisdom and the world, the whole wide world, and us, every person, one as an individual we are one you and Hashem you're one you and Hashem's wisdom you're one you and Hashem's will are one as long as we are separating ourselves from him in our mind we can start asking questions about him and if he's functioning as a creator as a loving father or not when he's over there in heaven with all his powers and me, I'm here stuck in why am I swamp of despair and I need help. And where's the money? And where's the key? And where's the salvation? And why I didn't receive my car yet? And why I don't have the power and the energy to do this and that? And why my prayers are not being answered? Because you are separating yourself. We are still separating ourselves from the Creator. But now think about it. If we said that He and us, we are one. So when we are separating ourselves from Him, it's actually that He is going through the same process. He Himself is being separated from Himself, from us. When you are alone, when you're stuck in your own pain and in your own grief, or even in your happy moments, and you're happy, and you're all good, but you are self-centered. In that moment, you are separated from the Creator. Only when your mind is divine and high, and looking on everything from a very high perspective, then you can understand the world. Because the world is not your individual world. It's not your private lane that you're walking, driving on. You are part of something much wider. We are part of a system that is endless. If you look at a movie, and in that movie you saw the hero, that he was born here and he crossed 70 years of his life, you can, r r how you say, rewind? That's how you say it? Rewind. To go to, to, the, to the beginning and to see the movie again. Also your life 
in a certain aspect is a movie like that. Why? Because how do you experience your life, your connection with the Creator, in the present time? All your life you experience them now. Also in your past when you experienced something as a child, as a child you experienced it in the present time of you being a child. And in the future, when your dreams will come true, you're not going to experience it in the future. You're going to experience it in the place that will be called the future, but in the present time. You will always, you are always only who you are right now. And the past is your memories. And the future are your hopes, your imaginations, your dreams. But there is no reality to your past and to your future in no other way except of experiencing them in the present time. So the present time is the real answer for who the Creator is. Because He is Haya Hove Veye. He is the one that was, He is the one that is with us right now, and He is the future, He is the one that will be. And He is the one that is with you in all those times above time. So the Creator that He is not under that limitation of time, He is not limited to our time tunnel that we are crossing the world through, the world our lives through. He is above time, so for Him every moment is an eternal moment. He experienced it all as one, at once, in the same time. For him there is no time. So the world is not only round and I'm here and you're there and people in Alaska are over there doing whatever and people in China are doing different things and people in the Holy Land of Israel, oh they're over there, it's so amazing. No, it's not only that. It's also all the different time zones. It's also all the history and all the future to come. Alright? So there's a movie. You are not only who that you are right now sitting on that chair, you're also that person that knocked on the door 20 minutes ago. You're also that person that left her house one hour ago. You're also that person that had a very rough childhood in a different state. And all that movie take place in the same time, above time, in reality. And those are the worlds. And not only your life, because your life are very important. And you feel them. And they're important to you. And they're important to the Creator that spends His time, eternal time, with you. But someone else that lives in Tibet, and he lives totally different life, his life are meaningful in the same way. And he walks on different planes and talking different language and enjoying different things and have a whole different world around him with no end. And everything is different but meaningful. And not only people, also animals, also flowers. And they're coming in reincarnations and coming back to the world and in and out like a dolphin that swims in the sea, coming back to life. And one time they're rolling into this world as a flower. And after that an animal is eating that, it, it becomes to be an animal. And if a person will hunt that animal and will eat the animal, that same flower will become a human being. It's weird. It's crazy. Water can come down in a rain over here and can be picked up by a person and, and, and to wrap it in a bottle and to go to another state and someone else going to drink it and he's going to sweat and the same particles of water going to rise and going to become clouds in a different part of the universe. And that's how those particles of creation are running in crazy circles and the Creator can see their movements. And the Creator is able to track them down. He can recognize every movement because there is history. Everything is written. There is an eye, there is an ear that receives all the information, that collects all the knowledge, that makes all of it happen. You need to climb out of your limited body with the power of your mind and to look at the creation 
as creation to look at it as handmade of the creator and to understand that before time before the creator created the world and brought down physicality to the world everything was spiritual and there was only him himself and there was no one else except of him and from that reality of his infinity there is no way out he is who he is and it will never change now he made something so huge and in the same time so opposite to who he is because he is one and he created worlds of separation he created curtains to separate one fish from its best friend one person from his beloved one and they can never meet and even if they're talking to each other and even if they love each other the most they're stuck in their bodies in their prisons and they cannot penetrate to each other's mind and even if there is some access with emotions with feelings with caring with support with appreciation with good amazing attributes still we're all still in prison but who are we who are we if there was no one else except of him and then he created worlds of separation and sent that life beam of life into creation into the core into the center of physicality and you're alive from within what is alive in you that the soul is giving you life is reviving you you're breathing are you breathing oh yeah I just noticed I'm breathing you're not breathing someone is helping you to breathe someone is reviving you you're running your blood your heart listens to your voice he's keeping your your orders your commands nothing works based on your will it's all God's work it's all Hashem's the creator of the universe desire whatever he wants takes place now who are you who am I I believe and that's my answer that we are the reflection of his godliness we are showing the life that's been given to us out to the world we're just who we are now we still do have a free choice and that free choice is the thing that makes us so unique and powerful and that free choice is the tool that's been given to us to change the nature to climb above rules of nature and to uplift and shift this creation that today is heavy that today is suffering that today is in pain to a fantastic place of redemption of salvation and for that moment we keep on seeking and looking for the creator even if we cannot recognize him only for the complete redemption only for the complete salvation because if you're going to receive the car that you desire if you're going to get married with that woman that you love so much and your prayers will be answered i promise you that after a couple of hours you're going to start desiring new things it will not fill your cup it will not answer your needs you will always need going to need your children to be healthy to get married to have houses that their children will be healthy and your grandchildren's to be healthy and if you're lucky your great grandchildren's to be healthy and to find shiduchim and to get married no end to your desires why because your completion is not here yet because the answer that will satisfy you that will bring you to completion to relaxation to your salvation is only the cure and the health and the complete salvation of the whole wide world 
your car, your house, your apartment, your money, your in life insurance, your mortgage covered, your whatever, happiness, your children, your, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding of the Gemara, of the Torah, of the Chumash, will not answer your needs if you are or cheap or angry or kind or merciful. If you're mercy, if you care, if you love people, if you want people to be healthy, if you're help, healthy, it doesn't help you. If you're healthy and rich and wealthy, it doesn't help you. It doesn't solve your problems because I have a friend that is stuck now with an illness with no cure in Jersey City and I want to help him. And nothing helps me as long as he feels bad with himself. I don't have an answer. I can be healthy as a bull and, and, and stable as a mountain and I'm not happy. Nothing can answer my needs until I'm going to hear that my friend that is close to me like my soul, that is precious to me like myself, will be cured completely. And I'll hear from him that he's good. Not from a third party, from him. That he will tell me the glory of heaven, that he will praise the Creator, that he will say that all his prayers have been answered, and not only his. I want your prayers to be answered, and your prayers to be answered, my wife's prayers to be answered, my children's prayers to be answered. What's going on with the salvation? That's the answer to our question. That we believe that the Creator, the Creator, who is the Creator? We just asked. Who is the Creator? I'm asking you. And where is He? I'm asking you. He is stuck with us in the same loop, in the same problem, in the same prison, in the same exile. He is stuck with us. He is us. Betoch ami anochi yoshavet, inside my people I live. The Creator lives inside of you. He is you and you are Him. And for us it's hard to understand why. Because we've been exiled into our individual bodies, into that world of separation, and we yearn and desire infinity that in an ancient memory exists somewhere in the back of our minds. And we desire that peaceful infinity to come back. But until it will, we won't be healed. We won't be okay. And Hashem is also not okay. And therefore, as loyal children to that beloved Father, we need to rescue Him. We need to help Him. And on that the verse is saying, Lishuatcha kivinu kol ayom. To your salvation we were waiting all day long. Not for you to save me. Who am I? I'm piece of zero. I'm piece of nothing. Who am I? Who am I to care about myself? Ask me, do you care about yourself? I can swear to you that I couldn't care less. And the same wife will testify on that, and the same children and the same students, can, the truthful ones, can testify on that. I don't care. I don't care about myself. I do have needs. When I'm hungry, I need to eat. When I'm dead tired, I need to sleep. But I do the minimum that I can. And I'm not that I'm not enjoying food. And I'm, no, I am. I'm a normal person. But when I'm awake, when I'm sober, when I'm okay, I'm functioning. I'm doing the best I can. And therefore, I couldn't care less about my needs because I'm fine. I'm okay. I just want to have the power to keep on running and helping everyone else. Because that's the answer to my request, to my prayer. That's what I want to know that you are good. That everyone else are good. That's my need. That's my dream. That's my completion. And there, in that point, I can find Hashem. When I understand that the verse is saying that Hashem, He is a prisoner, Melech Asur Birhatim, that He is a king, that His hands are tied to the edges of our mind. He walks with you in the valley of death, 
When you're walking in the valley of death, Hashem is walking with you. Not as a godly creator above the sky that is looking through a crack. He's you and you are Him. He's your life. He's your existence. He sent Himself into that world of chaos into that world of illusions, into the darkness of physicality, and trapped himself into those cells, into that prison that he cannot escape from. The same Creator that can do anything he desires cannot redeem himself. Because a prisoner cannot take himself out of prison. He needs someone else to come and open the lock, to bring the key. What's the key? Everyone has a different key. And everyone needs to bring their key. Everyone needs to bring their talents. Everyone needs to bring their abilities. Everyone needs to bring their life experience. Everyone needs to bring their power, needs to bring their energy, their wisdom, all their gifts that they've been blessed with to the game, to the play, to the war, and to fight, and to scream, and to cry, and to battle, and to argue, and to praise and to thank, and to appreciate, and to do your honest job. That's my answer to this equation, to that question, to that hard mystery that no one can answer. That I know that the Creator is in the same problem with me. Because if I would know that I have a billionaire father, and I'm stuck with no money for rent, and he's not helping me, I would have an issue with him. So to think that the Creator, He has all the powers in the world, but it's a test. <laughs> I'm not playing no games. I'm me, myself, who that I am. I'm not playing in those games. No one is testing me. I'm not under no one's magnifying glass. It's not me. Maybe you're willing to be tested. Okay, go be tested. Me? I don't let no one test me. I'm too honest for that. I'm too truthful for that. I'm too loyal for that, for tests. You have a problem with me? Tell me the truth. I want to deal with it. Don't test me. I won't test you and I don't want you to test me. I'm your brother. I'm your best friend in the world. You're testing me. If you're testing me, there is a problem of loyalty between us. And it's your problem because you are testing me. I'm willing to deal with the truth even if the truth will say that I am guilty. I will apologize. I will work on my midot. I will fix myself. I will go to the desert to work on myself. I will starve myself to death if that will be the solution and the completion to fix it all. I will do it. If I will hear that there is an answer, I remember myself. I went to few of the rabbis that taught me through life, and I went to them and I told them, I have issues in life. I have problems. Tell me a recipe, a solution. Command me. Tell me what to do. Not to sleep, not to eat, to learn 24 hours a day. Tell me what to do. Not to pleasure myself in no way, not to enjoy from anything. Tell me what's the answer to my problem and I will follow it. And when I said it, I know myself, I was completely honest. I was willing to take upon myself whatever I would hear. And I haven't heard. Because no one knows. No one knows. Only you know. About yourself, only you know. You know when you're truthful and you know when you give up. You know when you're serious and you know when you're slacking. You know when you're lazy and you know when you're powerful. You know yourself and I know myself. So I took responsibility on my life to be the best person I can be. And that's the answer to my questions. I don't have no more questions anymore. I'm going as a Baal Tshuva, as a person that owns the answer and I answer everyone the same answer. You should be who you are. You should bring your power to the game. 
You should bring your talents and you should work and you should reveal the godliness that is treasured and still in prison inside of you because you're scared to expose, to reveal your qualities. You're afraid from the world. My solution is to work. My solution is to help Hashem. Not to ask from Hashem to help us. Someone asked me on a certain topic, on a certain problem, issue that I was facing. He asked me, how many hours you prayed on that? I told him, me? Why are you asking? He said, because I know that once you were doing six hours on this and you were doing six hours on that. I told him, no, I'm not praying as much as I was. I'm doing much deeper work today. And it's not that I'm not praying. But I will not stand and beg for one thing for six hours. You know why? Because for me, as who I am, I'm not telling you don't go and do six hours. You, if that's your point in your avodah, if that's what you feel that you should do, that it will answer you, it's an amazing thing to go and pray for six hours. But to go and ask for mercy for my needs for six hours, I will never waste my time doing that. Because for me, it's so loud and clear that the Creator wants to give me. I don't have the slightest doubt about it. I'm sure that there is a different problem. The problem is not that I need to convince Him. He's my partner. He's my best friend. I don't need to beg for my best friend for mercy. And if he's not my best friend, so we're not friends anymore, I'm going to keep on doing the best I can in this world because I am who I am. With no connection to if my best friend is helping me or not. If my best friend is not coming for my help to answer my needs, I am 100% confident that he's not able to come. Because I know that when I'm able to come, I'm coming. And I'm 100% confident that if He would be able to come and help me, He would come to help me. And that's the answer to my question. I know that He's with me. I'm working in deeper layers than to beg for mercy. To beg for mercy, it's to pray for someone that is far away from you. That He has something that you don't have. And you might not be deserved for that. Me? It never crossed my mind. I know that the Creator loves me in unconditional love, like my love to Him. I can recognize His love to me because I have the similar love to Him. I love Him with no end. Even if He will kill me, I will desire Him. Even on my deathbed, I will look to the heavens and, and going to ask for the truth. It's a question of who you are and what's your truth. And connect yourself to your truth and be loyal to the light that you will find and recognize inside yourself. And don't be scared to go all the way with that investigation to find who you are and to recognize your mission in your prison, in your exile. Some a woman asked me a question about differences between men and women. I said, you're not a woman. You are a soul. You are now in a mission, in a feminine body, and you need to go and do your job as a woman in this lifetime. But you are a soul. You're not a woman. You're a soul. Even Adam and Eve, they came down as one soul to this world. And then Adam was so sad and depressed because he saw the animals that they came down in, in pairs. So he begged for heaven for mercy because he already, his mind was already exiled. He was already exiled. Even that he was in the Garden of Eden, he was already exiled from the illumination of the world to come. Of, of infinity, of before creation. And because that he was already exiled into the first station, Garden of Eden, that fantastic, it was still part of this world. And in that narrow place for him, 
For the godliness that was shining one moment ago for him, that darkness brought him to that sadness that created separation. And he asked for a companion. He asked for, for, for a soulmate. So the Creator put him to sleep and separate Eve from him. She was already there, but he couldn't see her. That was his issue. That he was already blind. He couldn't see. He couldn't see that his wife was with him. They are one. Couples are one. Couples are not two separate bodies. Couples are couples in soul. They're soul mate. It's one soul. He couldn't see it. He couldn't recognize it. So he asked for the separation. And then they asked for more and more and more. And that's where we are today. Separated and lost. Like a herd with no shepherd. Don't know the way. The way is not there. The way is in. You need to look inside. To go back to the truth. And even if we're so scattered and separated and so distanced one from each other. The way back is from within. And in one moment the Creator will gather everyone to one place. And from four wings of the universe, everyone will go to praise Him and to thank Him. And that's the redemption day. And in the redemption day, you're talking about the wide, whole wide world surrendering to Him, giving all its power to Him. That really all the ones that knows how to play will play. And all the ones that knows how to dance will dance. And all the ones that knows how to run will run. And everyone will use their talents. The artistic ones will show the world their art and the way they can show beauty of the heavens. And the ones that knows how to sing will sing with no end. And the animals will praise and everyone on the side of the mountains will run in thousands. And birds will fly in billions of birds and you're going to see heavenly architecture in the, in the sky. You're going to see you, like everything, all the clouds. You, every, you, all the creation will show His greatness, will show the unity. All the lanes, all the paths, all the ways, everything will lead to the house of heaven in the holy city of Jerusalem. Everyone will come from China, from Japan, from Russia, from Tibet, from Quebec, from Canada, from, from Alaska, from the States, from Europe, from Africa. Everyone, everyone will run, everyone will drive, everyone will fly, everyone will swim, everyone, all the dolphins, all the whales, all the fish, all the birds, everyone, all the creation will come. In all its glory, in all its beauty. But we need to understand now from the exile that we're not part of the exile. That we are one soul and when we will get that with our mind, that's the answer. When enough people, not everyone, enough. There is a certain amount of light that is needed. When enough people will grab it, that you are just part of the tale. You're a letter in the Torah. You're just that soul. You're just that one that experienced that path. And it's not so important. Because someone else, like I said, that is stuck in Germany and he doesn't know what to do with his piano and he's stuck and you have to sell the piano because it's for years standing and blocking the space. He is as important as you because like he's suffering and the piano is just stuck there and he doesn't know what to do with his life. And every animal in the world is as important because it holds life. The life of a deer, of an animal, of a rooster, of a bird. They're all the same. They hold life. It's the life of the creation. Every flower, every grass. It's life. Life in all its forms, in all its coverings. Was it too long? Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We hope you enjoyed this video very much. Please now remember to subscribe and like this video and share it with your friends to help spread faith in the world. For more, please visit amuna.com. May your light shine always and your requests should be answered with the greatest blessings. Amen.